Thank you for joining me on Synthesis Workshop. Today I'm very excited to have the show's first guest appearance in our first ever Research Spotlight episode. In these episodes, we'll have specialist guests give talks on their recently published work. In today's episode, I'm thrilled to have with us Dr. Noam Saper. Noam recently graduated from UC Berkeley, where he worked with Professor John Hartwig, studying the mechanisms for the nickel-catalyzed activation and functionalization of strong bonds. Noam is currently a senior process chemist at Exemplify Biopharma in Cranberry, New Jersey. All right, Noam, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Matt, for the kind introduction and for providing me the opportunity to discuss my PhD research in the laboratory of John Hartwig. The story I'd like to tell you about today combines two active areas of research in the group, the CH activation of arenes and the hydrofunctionalization of unactivated alkenes. The simplest merger of these two areas of research is the hydroarylation reaction of unactivated alkenes with unactivated arenes. We'll see that some of the unique reactivity of the nickel complexes that catalyze this transformation come from stabilizing non-covalent interactions in the secondary coordination sphere of the metal center. The hydroarylation reaction of an unactivated alkene with an unactivated arene is an atom economical sp2 transformation to produce either linear anti-Markovnikov or branched Markovnikov alkyl arenes. The products from this reaction are valuable chemical feedstocks for the detergent, plastic, and fuel industries. Unfortunately, the regioselectivity of this transformation is difficult to control and the linear products are inaccessible with common Friedel Crafts alkylation chemistry. I'll stop here and just acknowledge that all the work that's been done in this project has been done in collaboration with Professor Yoshiaki Nakao at Kyoto University and his great team of researchers there. Shown at the bottom of this slide is the state-of-the-art uh, catalyst for this transformation for the hydroarylation of simple arenes, uh, such as benzene with simple alkenes. As you can see, in all cases, the turnover numbers for these transformations are quite low because the substrates are both unactivated, and there's not a strong preference for the linear regioisomer over the branched product. The real research goal and overall challenge we're trying to accomplish in this project is to achieve the undirected hydroarylation of unactivated substrates without any directing groups. The inspiration for our catalytic system came from some previous work our group had done back in 2011 on the hydrogenolysis reaction of CO bonds in diaryl ethers. For this reaction, we used a nickel catalyst ligated by an N-heterocyclic carbene, shown in the box here, SIPR, as the ligand. We thought that maybe this same nickel NHC catalyst might be able to functionalize the strong CH bonds in unactivated substrates, in addition to the CO bonds, like in the diaryl ether example above. Indeed, we found that a small amount of the desired product was observed when the same conditions for the CO cleavage were applied to a mixture of benzene and terminal olefin. What was most exciting about this result was the extremely high regioselectivity for the linear to branched uh, regioisomers in this initial result. Moving forward, we tried to further improve the reactivity and the selectivity of this nickel NHC catalyst. We're able to do this by modifying the NHC ligand and the NHC scaffold in a variety of ways. As you can see, at the top of the slide, we reacted a mixture of excess arene with a terminal olefin in the presence of an NHC ligated nickel catalyst. When a simple and commercially available NHC ligand, uh, such as IPR shown here, was used, a small amount of the hydroarylation product was formed. We found that by modifying the sidearms of this NHC ligand with additional aromatic groups in the more sterically hindered IPR star scaffold, the yield of the catalytic reaction was slightly improved. Finally, we further modified the periphery of the aromatic sidearms with three 5 dialkyl phenyl substituents in the ligand L4, uh, which we called metaxylyl IPR star methoxy, or the ligand L5, where we used ethyl groups instead of methyl groups. With these two ligands, we're able to achieve about a 50% yield of the hydroarylation product with an extremely high uh, and unprecedented uh, linear to branch ratio of over 50 to 1. To further increase the yield of this transformation, we decided to take a closer look at the time course of this reaction to see where the rest of the starting material was going. As you can see in the graph below, indicated in red, the NHC ligated nickel catalyst does catalyze the transformation of the alkyl arene product. 
However, the much faster reaction occurring in solution is the nickel zero catalyzed isomerization of the terminal olefin starting material into an equilibrium mixture of internal olefins. Fortunately, the catalyst is stable under these conditions and only reacts selectively with the terminal olefins and not with the more hindered internal olefins. Therefore, to increase the yield of the catalytic reaction, we can simply extend the reaction time. Once the terminal alkene has reacted to form product, the catalyst is able to isomerize additional internal olefin to form an equilibrium amount of terminal olefin, which then reacts further to form more product. What we found is that if we extended the reaction time from one day to five days, we're able to achieve about 80% yield of the desired product uh, with high linear to branch ratio. Not only do these new ligands provide higher yields in this reaction, they also have much faster rates in this reaction. On this slide, you'll see the comparison between L1 and L4 in the initial rate for the hydroarylation reaction, and the ligand modification we've performed in L4 leads to a 23 times rate enhancement for the hydroarylation reaction. In terms of the substrate scope of this reaction, not only are simple terminal olefins, such as one desine well tolerated, but because of the ability of the nickel catalyst to isomerize internal olefins, internal olefins react well in this reaction, and perhaps more industrially relevant, even mixtures of internal olefins all react to form high yields of product. When the alkene has additional substitution at the alpha position, this reaction is done in under 24 hours, and in the case of T-butyl ethylene, we're able to drop the catalyst loading in this reaction and achieve about 280 turnovers. Other longer chain alkenes work well for this reaction, including those with protected alcohols or vinyl silanes. And I'll just note that in all cases, we only observe the linear alkyl arian product or the linear to branched ratio between the two regioisomers was found to be over 50 to one in all cases. In terms of electron neutral arenes, benzene, toluene, and xylene isomers all react well to form the hydroarylation product at the most sterically accessible position on the aromatic ring. Other more electron rich arenes, such as anisole, were not reactive under these conditions in high yields, but we found that electron poor arenes with fluorinated groups did give the hydroarylation product in high yields. Additionally, we've been able to develop one example of an intramolecular hydroarylation reaction with this arine substrate that possesses a pendant alkene. Moving forward, we had a few questions about this catalytic system that we really wanted to understand. Namely, we wanted to understand why changing the structure of the NHC ligand so far away from the reactive nickel center had such an effect on the catalyst activity like I showed before. In addition, we wanted to determine the mechanism for the CH activation reaction. Is it a direct oxidative addition of the CH bond in analogy to the mechanism we previously established for CO bond cleavage, or is there some other more complicated mechanism involved? Finally, is the high regioselectivity of this reaction a consequence of a rate-limiting alkene insertion step to form either the linear or branched alkyl metal intermediates, shown on the left-hand side of this slide, or does the high regioselectivity come from a difference in barriers for a reductive elimination step with these two alkyl metal intermediates to form the carbon-carbon bond? To answer these questions, we conducted a variety of experiments to fully understand the catalytic cycle. To begin, we incorporated a C13 label into the carbene-carbon of the NHC ligand so we could easily monitor the resting state of the active nickel catalyst under a variety of conditions by carbon NMR spectroscopy. What we found is that the resting state actually varies based on the identity and the concentration of the alkene partner. With unhindered alkenes, the resting state sits at a bis olefin complex, shown at the top right hand of this slide. With hindered alkenes, such as T-butyl ethylene, the resting state of the catalyst is actually an equilibrium mixture between the 8 6 benzene complex, shown in the middle of the slide, and a monoolefin complex, uh, shown on the left hand of the slide. In all these cases, we were able to observe these resting states by carbon NMR and also isolate and fully characterize them by X-ray crystallography, and the structures are shown in the bottom of the slide. The kinetics of this reaction are consistent with the resting states I've shown. With an unhindered alkene, the reaction has an inverse first-order dependence of the rate on the concentration of alkene. 
This means that the bis olefin resting state needs to lose an equivalent of olefin, bind arin, and undergo a series of steps which then include the rate limiting step. With the hindered olefin, the situation is a little bit more complex and we observe saturation kinetics. At higher concentration of alkene, there's a zero order rate dependence regime, meaning that the monoolefin resting state needs to bind arin and undergo the steps, including the rate limiting step. However, at lower concentration of alkenes, the resting state is actually the eta-6 benzene complex, and the catalyst needs to bind an equivalent of alkene prior to undergo the hydroaerylation reaction. To study the mechanism of the CH activation, we conducted a kinetic isotope effect experiment and found a KIE of 1.3. This small value indicates to us that the CH activation event occurs before the rate limiting step. We also stopped the reaction of deuterated arine at partial conversion, as shown here, and found that there was deuterium incorporation into the unreacted alkene starting material. This tells us that the process involving CH activation and migratory insertion is a reversible process. Finally, we used density functional theory to model the lowest energy pathway for the CH activation and found that it occurs by a unique mechanism called ligand-to-ligand -ligand hydrogen atom transfer, or LLHT. This is a concerted transfer of the hydrogen atom of a bound arine ligand into the double bond of a bound alkene ligand. LLHT has previously been proposed in the hydroaerylation of alkynes with phosphine ligate and nickel catalysts. To summarize the mechanism for the hydroaerylation based on our experimental results, we found that there were a variety of arine or alkene bound resting states that exist in solution based on the identity and the concentration of the alkene reactant. These all eventually funnel into a monoalkene monoarine complex, which undergoes LLHT to form a nickel 2 complex. This nickel 2 complex can isomerize to a T shaped uh, geometry and then undergo rate limiting reductive elimination to form the carbon carbon bond. The alkyl arine product can then dissociate and close the catalytic cycle. However, after all this, we still haven't answered our original question on the origin of the high activity of this NHC ligated nickel catalyst. To do this, we again turned to some DFT computations and modeled the barrier for the rate limiting reductive elimination transition state with both the small NHC, IPR, shown in blue, and the large NHC, metaxylyl IPR star methoxy, shown in red. Consistent with our experimental results, we found about a 4 kcal per mole difference in the barriers for the reductive elimination. We thought that maybe this difference comes from a steric difference in the transition state. Classically, with phosphine ligated palladium complexes, you might imagine a more sterically hindered ligand would push the two substituents undergoing reductive elimination closer together and drop that barrier. So let's see. When we look at the geometry of the transition states for both these NHC ligands, we see that the bond lengths and angles in these two structures are almost identical around the aryl nickel alkyl core. And this is not a traditional steric effect on reductive elimination. To explore whether there might be some other non-covalent interactions going on that were present in the transition state to account for this difference, we turn to look computationally at the distortion energies and the interaction energies with a variety of NHC ligands, shown at the top of the slide here. The distortion energy is the energy of how much the catalyst needs to physically distort to reach the transition state geometry from a relaxed geometry, and the interaction energies is a lump sum of many different intermolecular interactions in the secondary coordination sphere of the ligand. If we compare all these energies in a pairwise manner with the different NHC ligands, we're able to find out which specific structural elements of the NHC ligand allow for this stabilization of the reductive elimination transition state. Now, this analysis actually ends up producing a lot of data, but I'll just highlight one of the most important comparisons, which is between L1, like we said, uh, IPR, and L4, which is a ligand that works well in the catalytic reaction, metaxylyl IPR star methoxy. We found that the overall difference in energy between these two reaction pathways was about 7 kcals per mole, and about 2.5 kcals of this is coming from the distortion energy difference. This means that the larger, more sterically hindered ligand leads to a more rigid geometry in the transition state that distorts less during the reductive elimination. 
The main stabilization, however, is a 4K calcium mole stabilization from non-covalent interactions in the interaction energy. Uh, before, we thought that the steric hindrance was actually helping us, but we see by looking at this pairwise interactions and breaking down this interaction energy into its components with energy decomposition analysis, we saw that the polyrepulsive interactions are actually destabilizing and disfavor the reaction with the larger ligand L4. This makes sense because with such a large ligand, you introduce many steric interactions that you might not with a smaller ligand. But there are two stabilizing non-covalent interactions that counteract the destabilizing steric interactions. The first is a stabilizing electrostatic interaction from the introduction of pi stacking in the aromatic rings of the IPR star motif. And the second is a gain in favorable London dispersive interactions that you get when we decorate the periphery of the L4 ligand with 16 methyl groups all around the outside. This is uh, leading to favorable CH interactions or London dispersion forces that overall together with the electrostatic interactions and the distortion energy drop the barrier for reductive elimination with the larger ligand L4. To conclude, hopefully I was able to show you today that ligand design and a mechanistic investigation of a transition metal catalyzed catalytic cycle allows us to gain a deeper understanding of the functionalization of unactivated substrates such as arenes or alkenes. We developed conditions for the highly linear selective hydroarylation reaction, studied the full mechanism of this transformation, and performed extensive computations to show the importance of non-covalent interactions. I'd like to conclude by quickly thanking my PhD advisor for this work, Professor John Hartwig, for his support during my studies. I'd also like to thank Professor Nakao and his team at Kyoto University, the MGCF and X-ray facilities at UC Berkeley for this help, and the funding agencies shown at the bottom of the slide for their support. Finally, I'd like to thank Matt for giving me the opportunity to discuss my research with you all today. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out to me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. I'd be happy to answer anything. Thanks so much. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you've enjoyed having Dr. Noam Saper with us as much as I have. If you're interested in presenting your own published research through a Research Spotlight video, feel free to contact us by email. As always, follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.